Good afternoon, students. And today we are going to look at motivation in psychology. Motivation is a very important aspect of human life. And all of us have heard this word motivation, motive. And we have different understanding of this topic. We can also call this as why of behavior. Why we do what we want to do. Or why we do what we do can also explain motivation. There is something that makes us do what we do or what we want to do. That is motivation. And it's there in all of us because when we look at what we do, we know and understand that there is something that has made us do what we have done. So we will look at motivation in more theoretical approach as it will give us deeper understanding of this topic, motivation. Now it's a very broad topic and as I said that uh, we will have to look at different approaches to explain this topic, motivation. To start with, we look at the instinct approach of understanding motivation. Now, what is instinct approach in motivation? What is instinct approach? Animals, including humans, are born with a set of behaviors that make us do or act in a certain way so that we would get a certain outcome or end product. These are called instincts. We have seen it in animals. And these instincts are actually uh, essential for our survival. Without these, we cannot survive or live. So this approach, approach suggests that we are born to be motivated. However, there are many questions that this approach cannot answer. Example, what and how many instincts exist? Now we can uh, try to see what is this instinct approach. And as I said, if we have seen animals, they do a lot of things because they have an instinct. And similarly, we also have certain instincts from birth which helps us to live on, to survive. Now, what is the next approach? We will come to instinct approach later in detail. What is drive reduction approach? Now this approach suggests that our body has a tendency to act in such a way that a steady internal status maintained. We call it homeostasis. For example, if you are hungry, you are motivated to look for food to reduce your hunger drive. And body also will make sure that you have that drive called hunger because without that your body homeostasis or your balance will be lost. You need to have certain amount of sugars in your blood. You need to have certain uh, temperature to be maintained in your body. So hunger or thirst, we all need to have this to live, to survive. And these are called primary drives or motives. So somehow you will want to fulfill this drive. So that's called drive reduction approach to understand motivation. So we are motivated because there is a drive or a force that pushes to reduce this uh, hunger drive or primary drives in our body. Now there are two types of drives. One is primary drives these are related to the biological needs like hunger, thirst and even sex was one of the primary drives. Then later it was removed from this list of primary drives because sex was not really essential to survive. The secondary drives are those related to our prior experience and learning. Like we can also call them social drives or we can call them learned drives because the, those are uh, not instinct, they are learned and they are learned from our experience and from others. For example, 
the drive to achieve the drive to excel the drive to belong to a group all these are secondary drives basically they are not essential for us survival whereas the primary drives are essential for us to live now the other approach is the arousal approach this approach came about because there were situations which the drive reduction approach could not explain for example why people seek challenges and thrills like bungee jumping rather than trying to reduce a drive these thrill seekers are motivated to maintain or increase excitement they always want the you call it colloquially they want a kick out of life they want to do things that will bring a kick in life so this is called the arousal approach people are not trying to reduce any drive but they want to seek something which will give them an increased arousal or a thrill so this is the arousal approach that explains motivation in some way this approach is similar to the drive reduction approach this arousal approach to motivation suggests that if our excitement level is too high we try to reduce it if our excitement level is too low we try to increase it by seeking stimulation now we have several examples uh, for arousal approach people always want to do something which others have not done you would have noticed people walking backwards for a long distance people trying to live with uh, snakes for a few days inside a cage people who want to do bike rides people who want to do uh, mountain climbing and bungee jumps these are people who are uh, driven by the arousal approach if we want to explain motivation through this approach the next is the incentive approach to understand as i'm trying to give you all these approaches to make you understand that how a motivation is working what is uh so suppose you now understand what is arousal approach when motivation is something that drives us to do things which will bring us a little thrill and stimulation that is motivation according to arousal approach now there is another approach called incentive approach we are motivated to get what we want for example if we want good grades we have to study well if i have to get a medal i have to run fast if i have to join olympics i have to practice from district to state to national level so if i want something i have to do something and i will do something and that is my incentive because i will get so i'm looking for a reward or an incentive and this is the way motive is explained through this approach not motive uh, motivation now the next approach is cognitive approach cognitive approach to motivation suggests that we are motivated by our thoughts by our expectations and goals okay that our own thoughts will motivate us our own expectations or anticipations and goals that we have will motivate us that is cognitive approach as i have told you cognition means thinking now there are two types of motivations in this approach according to cognitive approach one is intrinsic motivation what is intrinsic motivation in this we do things because we enjoy doing them like for example we like to exercise because it makes us feel good it something that we enjoy why do we play a game because we enjoy it that's intrinsic motivation which, which brings us a satisfaction and inner joy and happiness what is the next one extrinsic motivation 
we do this because of the tangible rewards an outward reward that is getting a good grade a gold medal or we get money if we do this work i get money we uh, for example we do exercise because we enjoy it that is intrinsic motivation we do exercise because we lose weight that is extrin extrinsic motivation so do you understand what is intrinsic motivation there we are doing something because it brings us enjoyment or satisfaction and happiness in extrinsic motivation we do something because it has an outs outward visible reward we should be highly motivated if we get paid to do what we love right this is not true because extrinsic motivation can sometimes undermine intrinsic motivation in one study children who really enjoyed drawing were either promised or not promised a reward for their drawing it was found that children who were promised a reward were less likely to draw again later so if extrinsic motivation is right they would have wanted to draw again because they were getting an award but they were not uh, motivated to draw again though they knew they were getting a award a uh, reward so extrinsic motivation extrinsic motivation does not mean that it's always that people do something because they get a reward they will do it because they enjoy it as per intrinsic motivation so i hope you understand the difference between these two types of motivations under cognitive approach it's about our thinking why do we do something one either because it brings us happiness or uh, satisfaction we enjoy it to its extrinsic where it is we are getting an outward reward somebody claps for you somebody will give you a gold medal because you are doing thing doing something uh, now we all have uh, heard about abraham maslow initially when we did the first chapter in psychology we looked at several schools of psychology or thoughts of psychology and in humanistic school of psychology we learnt about maslow and carl rogers who believe that we have a choice to do what we want and it's we are responsible for our using our potential for our own growth and that's what carl rogers and abraham maslow maslow believed and so maslow's hierarchy of needs is something very popular hmm? Abraham Maslow is a psychologist he came up with a model of motivation it's a very simple but very very meaningful model according to his model which is like a pyramid he says that we are motivated to satisfy our needs in a bottom up manner down to top manner what he says is we first satisfy our basic physiological needs needs such as water food we have to live with it without it we cannot live we can even call it our primary drives as we saw it earlier instinct these are necessary for a survival so abraham maslow says that basically uh, we first have to be satisfied with the physiological survival needs when these needs are satisfied we move up to the second level which is our need for safety to be secure safety doesn't mean only uh, a physical safety but it also means a sense of security a safe place a shelter also only after these two needs basically physiological and safety needs are very basic safety means a home a shelter and then people go on to the uh, uh, other uh, four levels that are met for reaching the topmost self actualization which is a state of complete self fulfillment so basically maslow says the uh, first human beings want to fulfill their physiological and safety needs 
and then they go on to social needs. What are these social needs? Social needs are wanting to belong to a group, sense of belongingness, want to, want to be approved by others, want to be uh, part of a family or a group or a peer group. So that is our social needs. And uh, the second level, the next level, this higher level, which when these three are met, people also go on to seeking needs to have a sense of esteem, respect, dignity, prestige. These are the, this level needs where they want to achieve, they want to excel in something, they want to be known, famous, and that's esteem needs. They want to respect themselves for what they do, for what they are, and they also want to be esteemed by other people for what they are in the society. That is the next level. And the, as I said, the topmost level is self-actualization, where one person has been aware of his or her potential. The person is fully aware of what he or she is capable of, and the person uses all his or her potentials to become what he's made for, to realize all the potentials. It's like a balloon, when a balloon is given to people, some people blow it fully, some people blow it half and leave it because they're tired, they feel it's enough, some people just don't blow it at all. Same way, all human beings, according to Maslow, uh, all human beings are given a potential or have a potential within them. It's like a little dot. It's up to the person to recognize it and to expand it. The little circle can become a full-blown circle if the person makes an attempt to develop this circle, the circle within, the potential within. It's like a balloon. You take it and blow it to the full potential, full capacity of the balloon. And that is what Abraham Maslow talks about, self-actualization. When a person feels that he has reached a state where he feels he has achieved all that he's capable of. And when we look at uh, our own examples, we can even think of uh, the Abdul Kalam. He was someone who we can say would have self-actualized, would have felt that he is, he's a man of self-actualization.